Hi, um, my name is Rachel Gizelquist, and I'm a research fellow here at UNU Wider. Um, I was wondering if you could tell us a bit more about some of the policy lessons that are emerging from the analysis of the, the global um, MPI. In particular, for instance, if you think about changes, the countries that have changed most rapidly uh, in the global MPI measure over time, is there anything that jumps out in terms of the sort of policy steps they've taken? Or compar comparing, for instance, the global MPI with income-based poverty measures, where, you know, where there's the greatest gap, is there anything that comes out in terms of policy there? Thank you. Okay. Yes, here. Yeah. My name is Pascal Do. Um, I am the author of a PhD dissertation, The Role of Higher Education in Poverty Reduction at the University of Tampere. And within uh, this research, I used uh, two <laughs> contradictory titles. One was Why Poor People Remain Poor by G. And another one was Why the Rich Countries uh, Became Rich by Reinhardt, published in 2007. Um, I was going to find out if the MPIs um, are coterminous to mitigation of poverty. And um, if it is, uh, I would like to know how you situate the role of higher education. Because when I wrote the thesis, uh, not only education and higher education, but science. When I wrote this thesis, I argued that um, science, higher education, uh, uh, was very central, even in addressing the eight MDGs. And if um, you side with me, then I would like to ask another question. Would, I have the impression that when I see the example of Africa, that the MPIs uh, undermine the power side of the game, political poverty. What do you think? Thank you. OK, we'll go here in the front. Hello. I'm Carlos Gradin, I'm research fellow here at UNOWIDER. And I would like you to stand a little bit on the uh, added value of using an aggregate multidimensional index uh, complementing the well-established uh, consumption uh, poverty measure of, uh, used by the World Bank. I, th I have no doubt that we are adding uh, something with this new index, but I still wonder what is exactly what we are adding. Because if uh, these dimensions were highly correlated with consumption, we would get basically the same measure, maybe with a different level of the poverty line, higher or lower, but the added value would be uh, small. We always should be look at different dimensions separately, but the fact of aggregating all dimensions in one index. So it is the lack of correlation between consumption and this uh, aggregate indicator what where we find the, 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 the added value. And I wonder what is, or what do you think it's the main source? So I could think in terms of a measurement error, maybe consumption is not a good measure of well-being because it's more difficult to report than uh, years of schooling or having uh, a dead child, etc. which I think, I, I think it's, they are easier to, to report in, in, in the survey. Maybe it's because in some areas, income doesn't buy better education or better health because you need some infrastructure, you need the schools, you need healthcare centers. Or maybe it's because some households could achieve their consumption above the poverty line, making sacrifices in their health or in their education because, for example, using child labor or working longer hours. So what's uh, your understanding of we, we, what type of households are we adding to the global poverty picture that we would miss using the consumption uh, poverty measure only? Thank you. So three quite challenging issues, policy relevance, education, Africa, and the value added of an aggregate. So 
the mismatch between income and multidimensional poverty at the household level is quite large. For example, in Bhutan, where 12.6% 12 12 of people were monetary poor, consumption poor, 12.6% 12 12 were multidimensionally poor, 3.2% were both. So overall, 21% 20, of people were poor, but only 32 had both types of poverty. And if you look in China, if you look in Chile, if you look in different countries where the poverty measures come from the same survey, you can look at that mismatch, and it's consistently high. Why? We don't know. That requires qualitative work. As you said, some of it will be the volatility of the consumption poverty measure. Some of it may be uh, household spending patterns or you know, burdens of disability and dependency. Uh, but we also need to, to know more, because these are households maybe where the service provision is similar. Uh, another cause of mismatch would be service provision being quite different in one area than another. And so you do see places where there's plenty of service provision, but perhaps not the livelihoods. And so the MPI levels would be low, or vice versa in the region Gaza, since we're on Bhutan, or Papua New Guinea in, in Indonesia, it's the same. Or sorry, yeah, uh, the monetary poverty is very low, but multidimensional poverty is very high because there are no services, but there is, for various reasons, in the two regions, income. So I think they're capturing different kinds of deprivations. Now, what does an aggregate add to uh, a dashboard? And I didn't show the slides on that. But if you were to look across the 10 uh, indicators of the global MPI, uh, then you would find that 75% of the population were deprived in one of them, 3.9 billion. Um, and so it's quite capacious. It, it would identify a lot of people if you said if you had any of these deprivations, you were poor. So a feature of uh, multidimensional poverty aggregate is that it, in a sense, it focuses in on people who have multiple deprivations simultaneously. And so your resources, your fiscal resources, which are limited, are going to be contained a little bit to the people deprived in a third or half or whatever the poverty cutoff is at the same time. And so there's plenty of empirical work showing uh, what the difference between just having a dashboard uh, and where any deprivation reflects is it equal in importance in a sense and having an aggregate multidimensional measure? I don't know if that helps. And to Dr. Pasquale in higher education. Um, so you asked if reducing MPI was coterminous with ending poverty. And clearly, it's, it's only partial. So like the target said, poverty in all its forms and dimensions, and all its dimensions would not be possible to measure. So an MPI only tracks the indicators that it contains. Um, so for example, if it doesn't contain livelihoods or if it doesn't contain violence, and those are important deprivations, then zero poverty could be coincident with high deprivations in those areas. I think your question about higher education was a different one. And it was really saying in an environment in which multidimensional poverty is going down, perhaps for people without higher education, what is the role of, the, uh, of higher education and an educated population in driving that change? And that's a, a much more interesting question, um, but a complex one. So it's not one that we've looked at in terms of looking at the average level of higher education prevalence and seeing if that coincided with a faster reduction in MPI for the other, other portions of the population. But I think it would be interesting to explore. And to Rachel, clearly that's a, a very important question and a very ambitious question. We don't attempt to have cracked it. We've done you know, a few regression analysis. We've looked at a few determinants. Um, and what's very clear um, is that however you me measure growth elasticity, the elasticity of growth and multidimensional poverty are very low. So we don't have the same relationship you get with income poverty. It's not a surprise back from Bourguignon and others at the World Bank showing you know, it, the, the correlations are different. And so the drivers t would tend to be more associated with proactive social policies and s public expenditures, uh, as well as activities by other in stakeholders. It's also, interestingly, not necessarily good governance, at least not in low-income countries. So we did multi-level analysis. My, my colleagues did it, didn't find it. And also, if you think of Nepal, which actually reduced its MPI from 26 to 2011 the fastest, it didn't have a government for part of that time. It's, it, it, but somehow, they were able to sustain the social expenditures, and also they had high remittances and high uh, backflow of, of educated labor uh, into the country. So it's a very complex story. I think it's, it's country by country. We haven't done enough to be able to generalize yet. 
but again, our data are online, and so I'm hoping that others might take them and do the findings we haven't been able to. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks for this. We'll take the next round. Yes, here in this middle, a little bit in the front. Uh, hi, this is Jonas Uotinen from the University of Turku. Uh, I'm a PhD student at the Economics Department. Um, I wonder, is there a way for the MPIs or a modification of it with a possible addition to it to also inform the rich countries on their aims? As it seems, they are possibly a bit lost if, if we kind of try to move beyond the gross domestic product, then it's like, okay, what shall we aim then for? And this relates to, um, to also the, the, what is still missing from the capability theory. Um, there was uh, Barry Schwartz, for example, in, in 2000, in his article, who pointed out that it seems that uh, deducing from the, um, <clears throat> like, or he, he, he stated that the increased freedoms in United States as um, proxied by the, the increase of purchasing power over the 20th century has come, has led to greater um, anxieties and other uh, mental disorders instead of it being the contrary. So um, it, could there be some kind of addition that could um, lead us towards um, understanding of or, or of these issues. Some of the things that come to mind is perhaps some Aristote Aristotelian uh, ideas of, of realization of, of the human potentials and what could those be, as well as the, 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 the developmental trajectory of the human uh, according to the Western and Eastern developmental psychologists and thinkers. So these, these are some of the things that come to my mind that possibly could be added or something like this. Uh, I would like to hear your opinions on this. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm, there's a hand in the back. Thank you. I'm James Sinyan, researcher, University of Helsinki. Uh, you admit that poverty is a very fluid concept. And my question is simple. What's your definition of poverty and who is poor? Okay. And we'll take one in the far back again. Hi, I'm Pia. I'm a research fellow at WIDA. Um, I have a two-part question, and uh, I would appreciate your thoughts first in your researcher um, boots and then in the policymaker boots, if you can imagine, to Trump. Um, the first one is regarding the SDGs and implementation of the monitoring. Uh, an OECD report last year tried to put to work as many of these indicators as possible, and even the most developed and, let's say, data-rich OECD countries would not have most, or at least, I think, more than 80% of these indicators ready, lying around. Uh, my question to you is for the developing countries where these gaps are even larger, um, what would be the indicators you would kind of focus on in data collection? Where do you see the biggest gaps? The second part of my question uh, relates uh, to limited resources uh, in the sense of where do we get more data from? There's also a big push also championed by the World Bank for identification for development. Now, that has great potential, for example, linking in composite indices, of course, the different data sources, but it's also a very big exercise. Usually, it is argued from the side of uh, we can more easily um, distribute benefits and we can more easily monitor. Now, for your exercise, where do you see the value added? Or would you say, actually, you would prefer that more modules would be hooked on the already existing surveys that you work with? Okay, another three relevant to rich countries, the definition of poverty, major 
data gaps and where do you hook on? Yes, very good. So Johannes, um, in terms of the rich countries, certainly there's nothing that stops them also from having a multidimensional poverty measure. At least the EU silk is comparable across countries and we've been involved in Net Silk 2 and are involved now in Net Silk 3 exploring those options. Um, but your question was wider than that. And it might be relevant to mention the case of the Gross National Happiness Index in Bhutan, which is a nine-dimensional index which has health education living standards, like a poverty measure, a governance, time use, and the environment, and then community culture and psychological well-being. And in terms of uh, developmental uh, states, it was interesting when there was an international community interacting with Bhutan's Gross National Happiness Index, one of the lessons that they got quite interested in was that they realized that happiness is a skill and you can learn to do it. And so, in a sense, also coding where people are on that skill uh, of happiness, which you know, maybe people think is, is Buddhist, but it, you can also, from mindfulness or from psychology, you can enter into that path. Um, an interesting thing is when Bhutan grow, updated its Gross National Happiness Index in 2015, from 2010, there were statistically significant increases in material, you know, in income, in jobs, in healthy days, in uh, the services of water and sanitation and roads and electricity, um, in education. Uh, so all of those went up significantly. And overall, there was growth in Gross National Happiness Index. But in the psychological well-being category, every indicator significantly declined. So that was satisfaction with quality of life, positive affect, negative affect, and spirituality. Sense of belonging declined a feeling of etiquette and courtesy declined. And so what was interesting is because you had that panoply of indicators, you could see the, the, the simultaneous movement in different directions. And I think that that's quite useful for, in a sense, catalyzing a conversation about where societies are going and how, whether that matters, whether they like that change or might want to redress it. And to Jimson, um, uh, we work with most of my work is not on the national MPI, uh, on the global MPI. Most is with national governments who are doing their national MPIs when I'm not doing research. And clearly, the priority is that the voice, the protagonists of poverty, the poor people, would uh, have a very strong input. So, for example, in El Salvador, there was a two year participatory exercise uh, with different communities after the government already had a draft measure. And the draft measure had health, education, living standards, and employment in it. And after the participatory exercise, they added uh, lived environment and violence, because those came out so strongly from the communities. And it seems very important that a measure of poverty should reflect the experiences articulated by those in poverty. At the same time, you need very much this not to be only a statistical exercise, because if the Minister of Planning um, the Minister of Finance, if they are not on board and don't see its relevance, they won't use it. And so there's also been an interesting engagement in countries setting up different kinds of committees that in a sense have the user of the statistic so that by the time it's launched, like in Ecuador, President Correa launched it, the head of statistics explained it, the Minister of Planning, Nancy, and the minister who was doing the targeted social programming both spoke of how they were going to use it. And that means that a statistic um, has an audience that's anticipating its reduction and thinking towards action. So it seems that both involving the poor communities and, in a sense, the users of the statistics is key, alongside, of course, the statistical community. And to Pia, um, it's interesting. In terms of data gaps, um, what is, what the, we are secretary to a, a network of 53 participating countries who are designing or using multidimensional poverty measures. So I learn by listening. And what a number of them are saying now is that really it's up to them to prioritize. And they may not prioritize the missing data. They may prioritize actually making some steps based on the information of data that they already have. And I think localizing, um, or whatever term is going to be used, but setting priorities um, is very much uh, you know, the topic of the day because it's impossible to do them all. And for me, there's a big danger in multidimensional poverty measures if there is an explosion of them of simply statistical overload. There's too many numbers. And what we observe is that when there is a multidimensional poverty measure, then in a sense it brings together 10 
Costa Rica has 20 indicators, which is too many, but it's, it's a lot. But it brings them under one umbrella. And so in a sense, they get a kind of serious attention. And the, the danger with 232 is just dissipation, as we all know. Um, and so trying to find ways of making it easy for, again, statistical users to engage with the data that do exist in an action way, I think is, is more of a priority. Um, and so that's, that does, I mean, I'm just thinking of the countries, they, they are all doing new surveys, they're all adding little modules, but it's the ones that really seem to be more important in their contexts. And regarding the identification, there's also a downside, um, for example, in the Adhar program in India, you know, there's people who will be left out, people who, for whom it doesn't work, the fingerprint, or there's a, a risk of it being used in a way that may not be completely constructive and might be exclusionary or um, uh, harmful rather than just providing benefits. And so I think there are a lot of ethical questions. Um, it would be ideal if we could match different data sources, but uh, the, the distance from here to there is, is quite big. And so what we observe is that in many of the conversations on big data or the geospatial or the merging of data sources, um, it's very exciting. But if we want poverty data now, at the moment, that definitely includes poor people, it really has to come from household surveys. And I see that one of the dangers is that there, there are champions of big data. There are champions of geospatial this or administrative vital statistics that. But there's really no champion of basic household survey data that's extended in the way Sir Tony Atkinson recommended to look at missing populations and you know, some, some of the, the well-known problems of, of household survey data. But I do see that as an area that desperately needs ongoing investment and is being overlooked in the conversations. Thank you. Yes, here in the front. And then we will, yeah, let's take the front first and then. Hello, thank you. Oh. I'm the chairperson of the Finnish Deaf Association here in Finland. My name is Marku Jokinen, and I'm also the president of the European Union of the Deaf. My question is more of a comment to the MPIs and about the dimensions of poverty. One of, the, one of those is education. And I'm thinking, or, or my question is, what would be the other, other aspect would be also language and the use of language and also the in, in barriers in using language. Because education, you can get to ed education, but if the education is given in, in an other language than what is your natural language, then it's going to be a bigger barrier to you than getting into the education or getting the information. If there's information and you don't get it in your own language, it's not usable to you. So that's also a barrier in your life if you don't get the information that you need. And you cannot do the conversation with different people. And you also face this even greater barrier in your education and in, in acquiring knowledge. So what is your thinking about the, in the MPIs and the poverty connecting to this access to information and to language? So can you measure this and also can you eradicate poverty by this and what is, this, what is the relationship with language and I, I'm not a stati statistical person myself but I'm thinking about what is your opinion of these. I'm more of a linguist and an educationist. So this is, my, this is where my question is coming from, thank you. Sure. There was in the middle, there was a hand here, yeah, in the middle. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, my question is here. Before I ask the question, I would like to say something here. I think being a poor child today is most likely to be a poor parent in future. Being said that, my question is for you. Can you think an individual can be trapped in a poverty? If is, how does the MPI will 
uh, elaborate to explain it and how does it will help to reduce the poverty to, to cast the S, SDG goal. And my name is Rajiv Casey from Nepal. Thank you. Thank you. And then here in the center, just next to the uh, one who's taking all the video from today. Hi. Um, I'm Suravi from India. So I just wanted to ask, um, it, how do you find solutions or how, do you f how would you implement these goals in, in places that are so diverse? It's, even if you consider nations, um, each, like a country like India is so diverse, right? So the struggles of people would differ geographically. Um, and I'm, I'm a little nervous, but <laughs> it's, um, if you see poverty, it's the struggle to, um, I think it is the, when people are struggling to get access to health and education, and these are constructs, and the, I see poverty there when people are trying to get access to this because it's imposed on them in some way. And if, um, and as you say, the surveys are done at the national level, and even there, the data would be skewed because they wouldn't probably be accessing every region. Uh, I won't, I'm, I'm interested to know how the data set is collected related to a question that was asked there. But again, it's how do you connect these goals to places that are culturally very diverse? Sure. So how does this relate to the use of language, access to information? I guess the second question was about intergenerational transmission of poverty and how that relates to the multidimension index. And then how do you really do this implementation across such diversity? Very good. Um, in terms of language, uh, the example I can give is from Colombia. And it is when they realized that their national measure was not relevant for the indigenous community. And so they created an indigenous MPI with the community. And their number one request was for education in their language. And so it was uh, a very articulate demand for changing the specification of education to include the language of instruction. And so far, that's the only country that has put language into their national MPI. Um, but because that has visibility in other countries that have an indigenous population. At least that has been discussed. Um, so that it's incomplete, but it's what we have. Um, to Razif's uh, question in terms of intergenerational, so the global MPI uses repeated cross-section data, but there are studies with panel data. And with panel data, you can see, in a sense, the chronicity of multidimensional poverty. You can also see what deprivation changes so people drop into poverty. And four, if you isolate the people who are chronically poor across uh, time periods, you can see what is the caustic combination. What, is the, what are the deprivations they always have? Now, clearly, that'll be partly a function of how you've designed the measure. But it's interesting also to see what combination tends to be associated with chronic poverty. So at this, this stage, we're simply doing that kind of a descriptive analysis. Um, but uh, a colleague is thinking then of extending the poverty trap literature and doing more analysis on that. Um, but right now we're just going through different data sets with panel data to try to you know, uncover those combinations that tend to regularly be associated with chronic multidimensional poverty. There's also different papers. For example, Luis Felipe Lopez Calva of the World Bank found in one paper that um, multidimensional poverty was associated with chronic income poverty. Another paper found the opposite. So it's, it's still a literature in, in a time of flux, but interesting questions. And to uh, Sabida, I think, I'm not, no. Uh, in terms of your question, no, it's a very good question. And I must say, I'll give a little advertisement for Jola, uh, Sense and Solidarity. I don't know if you've read it, Jola Walla Economics for Everyone by Jean Dres, which came out last month. It's a fantastic book. And it's very much a book which has relevance to these conversations and to your question, because he articulates how 
um, research on poverty cannot go without um, an, a very real interface with poor communities and their activities. And that certainly Jean Dres embodies that in his own work. Um, and in our observations in India, the MPI work has gone ahead at the state level, not nationally. Um, and so Andhra Pradesh, for example, has a state-level MPI. Uh, Assam had one in its state-level state level human development report. So those have been the areas of interest. Um, but I think uh, in the, I gave earlier the example of El Salvador, but some of the interesting work is when NGOs understand an MPI, it's very simple. It's like a counting-based measure. And so the NGO sector can do it uh, easily in their own communities. You don't need fancy software. Um, so if you think of, uh, in Kerala, the program of targeting the destitute families or whatever, it's a counting-based measure. If you have three of these nine deprivations, you're identified as, as eligible. So it's an intuitive uh, work uh, approach that can be used locally and not just nationally. And I think that makes it more relevant, as you said, to the different deprivations of different cultural groups. Uh, so that, those are some suggestions. But in India, that's, yeah, we're, we're not doing anything nationally. Your question about data, so we are waiting for the NFHS4 data, which should come out in December, January in India, and it'll be representative at the district level nationally. So it is a huge survey, but it will have some representativeness. Um, but again, it may not pick up on specific uh, <coughs> contexts of different uh, regions. Okay, we will take the next round. So we will up here, in, almost in the front. Good evening. My name is Obin Gottfried. Um, I'm really interested in um, social and public policy, and I know what you are coming up with is going to be some of the basis for most policies formulations within um, national and international levels. Um, you talk about education about, um, in relation to poverty eradication, and I'm really interested when you talk about having access at least to the um, grade eight. And I'm, I'm really, I really want to know how getting up to grade eight, for example, can't really affect poverty um, reduction or eradication, eradicate poverty. Looking at most, especially if you look at um, developing countries, um, curriculum structure and mode of um, transmitting knowledge, do you think, or is there any kind of empirical evidence which shows that once somebody reaches grade, grade eight, it can really affect um, promoting or eradicating poverty? That's my question. Thanks. Okay. And then there was one here. Yes. Next to you, Tony. Good afternoon. My name is Jovin. Uh, enlightening presentation. Thank you very much. If I may, two questions. In two weeks, the United Nations Conference of Parties is happening. Uh, what would be one question you would like these decision makers to have in mind in order to move the conversation forward? That's one. The no, conference of what? The, the COP23 is happening uh -huh. in Germany. Yeah. And uh, second question is, as you churn all this data with MPIs and so on, I'm curious to know whether you see companies, startups, SMEs trying to plug into this data using big data technologies, et cetera, in order to move things forward in terms of applications, in terms of making use of this uh, great sets of information that you produce. Thank you. OK. okay. Here in the front. Uh, hello, I'm Jukka Virtila from University of Tampere and, and also affiliated with UAU Wider. Uh, I'd like to hear your views on, on moving beyond poverty to inequality. To what extent would it make sense to uh, use the same underlying indicators to measure multidimensional inequality? Because now it seems that the poverty is measured both in monetary terms and then in a multidimensional way, whereas inequality continues to be measured only in terms of uh, either income or, or consumption. Okay, on the, the eradication of poverty. 
on the use application of the generation of data that has been taking place, and then on can this be replicated for inequality? Very good. So, to open up, Godfrey, um, in terms of the eight years of education, that's basic education. And so we just used it because it's one of the levels. If you look at the national MPIs that are being developed, most countries employ their, the number of years of compulsory schooling, which is in effect at the time, and they vary uh, a great deal. Uh, uh, what we do in the global MPI is we had actually a range of different cutoffs for that variable, and we consulted. We implemented six years, eight years, ten years. Um, eight years is also not compulsory in all countries, but it seemed, because it's the basic education standard and it's beyond primary school, it seemed one that we, would, that we went with. Um, but I don't, you can cite certain papers, but when it's a global measure, it's, it's going to be messy. Um, and so the eight years is going to be you know, relevant in some places and not relevant in others. But uh, similarly, a measure of acute poverty will not be relevant in all places. Uh, but it will capture, in a sense, a, a consistent population of deprivations. Um, during, in terms of uh, the, there were two different questions. In terms of the business MPI, that is um, taken off in Costa Rica. So Costa Rica has a national MPI, and actually its development was co-funded by the business community. And then the largest bank was curious whether any of its employees lived in MPI poor households. So they got a PR firm to do a survey um, using just the questions they needed to construct the national MPI. And they did that. And to the interest, but also consternation, of the leaders, they found that there, were, there was a non-insignificant number of employees who were living in MPI poor families. And furthermore, they weren't only in the lowest paid jobs. There were some in the middle paid jobs. And these tended to be because of high dependency ratios, um, disability at home, high unemployment among youth. And, and so they looked at, the, the, again, the composition, the profiles of deprivations, and the, uh, implemented some vocational training programs in order to recruit some of the unemployed people and give them the proper skills and some other programs. That's then taken off, and now I think 80 institutions, 8-0 in Costa Rica, are trying to rep replicate it. So that's a, a point to watch. And some of them are international firms, so it may move outside Costa Rica uh, soon. Um, so I hope that's enough. In terms of inequality, um, theoretically, it's completely possible. So what you have is you have a matrix of people and dimensions. And if you take the 0, 1, whether or not they're deprived in something, um, you could do that or you could take their overall achievement. But if you take whether or not they're deprived in each indicator, you could take the reverse of that, which is whether or not they've attained a certain cutoff in that indicator, and, and aggregate. And so you have a score of weighted attainments, which is cardinally meaningful for the population. And then you can take that vector and you can make any inequality measure you want, tile 1, 2, Atkinson, uh, Gini, whatever, 90 to 10 ratio. I think empirically the problem is on the data side, not on the measurement side. Um, so, for example, I mentioned that if you take a union measure of the global MPI, then 75% of the world are poor. And that is largely driven by uh, cooking fuel. So many people cook with wood, um, but they may have good chimneys. So it's actually not a health risk, but the survey doesn't have the right question. So it's what I would call a spurious deprivation. It looks like a deprivation, but it's probably not for them. In the case of the global MPI, we censor it, we clean it. If the people are not deprived in one third of deprivations, 60% of people in Bosnia cook with wood, but they're not all poor, then we, we censor it from the data set. So what you would need to do for an inequality measure is limit it to those variables where the deprivations are accurate, in a sense. Uh, each, each attainment or each deprivation is accurate and you don't have the, uh, the data errors uh, of, of some indicators. So some of the global MPI indicators are very rarely censored. They're quite accurate. And some, particularly cooking fuel, is, is quite inaccurate. So that would be the, the difficulty. James and I are uh, doing a paper now both looking at inequality among the poor and then also looking at this attainment matrix. And, Atkinson Bourguignon inequality measures and, and what you can do uh, multidimensionally uh, with ver very similar techniques. 
um, as, as a counting-based poverty measure. OK. Further questions? OK. Um, yes, here. There are so many that second rounds will be difficult. Hello, uh, I'm Soumya. I'm, I'm also a visiting scholar at WIDER. I was uh, wondering if multidimensional poverty would be much lesser in those countries where gender relations are better because you're looking at these basic services, water, sanitation, and those, and particularly at children. So children are much better off, if, you know, women are also much better off in the region. So what are your views on that? Thank you. OK, one in the background. Olav Lundstel from NORAD. Uh, I'm just curious on the question of aid allocation coming from an aid agency. Um, how do you see the MPI and the impacts if you compare with the income poverty and the 190? Any, um, if you try to think about allocation by countries or by sectors or by themes, that's one. And the second one is the use of MPI in terms of guidance of policy reform. You talked a little bit about it. This obviously is a, it's a complex question, but I would be interested if you have any examples or if there is dialogue with governments and if you see anything in terms of expenditure patterns and thinking of expenditure patterns. Thanks. OK, thanks. And then here in the front, and that, I think, um, Tony Addison from WIDA. Um, the, ver the very first uh, WIDA annual lecture was given 20 years ago in March 1990, uh, 1997 by um, Nobel laureate Douglas North. Uh, and the world has made quite a lot of progress um, in 20 years on poverty, um, partly due to the MDGs and the SDGs. So um, if we could look 20 years into the future, what do you think the world of poverty will look like? How much progress will we have made? And how will we have made it? And which countries might be ahead and which countries behind? So if we go forward 20 years, what will our world look like? OK, three small questions. <laughs> um, one on the balance, the reference to gender. Um, the whole question of aid allocation and policy reform and how the index might help inform that. And then uh, what's going to be here in 20 years? <laughs> Very good. So on gender, I must say it, one of our disappointments is that the data that are available do not permit us to make a gendered MPI. We could make a women's MPI, but we can't have one where we can disaggregate meaningfully by gender. We've disaggregated the global MPI, but we haven't published the results because it's, it's not correct. It just reflects the demographic structures of the societies. So I think really we have called for, in fact, our network, I mentioned we're the secretariat of our network, the network designed a gendered survey and proposed it for the SDGs so that we could uh, have within the household uh, multiple uh, respondents, we looked into a, a feasible and inexpensive way of sample design for doing so, and we designed the survey. Um, it didn't go anywhere. So I think really there I would join my voice with many others and call for better gendered data um, going forward because we can't really uh, use this data and, and, and answer your question uh, because we simply have no information on intra-household sharing. That being said, um, we have done individual child poverty measures and we're doing more of them, we're doing a lot of them, where we use the global or the national MPI for a number of indicators, and then for, for example, schooling or cognitive development and nutrition uh, or health, we look across the age cohorts of children and have individualized indicators. And those, we do show up gender differences. Uh, so that's, I think, a step forward, and there are data for doing the child poverty measures in the mixed surveys. Um, but it is a... It's a disappointment and it's, it's baffling that we don't have better data. In terms of aid allocation, um, it's not an area in which I'm an expert, but we had a little bit of a look this year um, because of the, first of all, the disparity between the low-income country uh, 
uh, category and where the MPI poor people live, with 72% of them living in middle-income countries, which is similar to the percentage Andy Sumner found uh, with uh, monetary poverty. Um, when we looked at the aid distribution, and we took used different definitions, and they're published in our uh, policy briefing of this year, we found that um, the distribution across low and lower middle in and middle income countries was actually surprisingly more balanced than we would have anticipated. But what we found was that the allocation per poor person, according to the MPI, was very, very noisy, um, with India and China having less than a dollar per poor person per year, and, and other countries having you know, a huge amount. Now, clearly, that's influenced by PPP. Clearly, it's influenced by um, national uh, public expenditure patterns that aid flows tend to complement. Um, but there, there's, I think, a lot to be unpacked. And so all we can do is we can say, per MPI poor person, what are the aid flows to these countries in nominal terms? And then the conversation must go beyond that with others. Um, and in terms of policy change, I could give the example which President Juan Manuel Santos of Colombia would give uh, in that case, which is he uh, launched the MPI in 2011 and he set a target for its reduction. And then he worked with McKenzie and he worked with public expenditure people to try to figure out the best patterns of fiscal expenditure um, to be used. He had a committee that met twice a year. Um, the ministers could not send deputies, they had to meet with him. Annually, they updated their national MPI, and in between, they updated it using administrative data to try to look at the trends. And then when an indicator was not moving to plan, they had responsive policies. And so they were able to greatly accelerate the reduction of multidimensional poverty. They'd analyzed it back since 1996 using the same survey. So they could expand, accelerate reduction, but it was using the same fiscal envelope. And so the same budgetary envelope, just spending it better. So that's the kind of, of story, as I mentioned, Costa Rica is another one that it's invested a lot in allocation because they found there was zero allocation to some of their MPI indicators and that the allocation to the poorest regions was not um, comparable to the extent of poverty in those regions. So the rebalancing of existing resources seems to be a very common first step that does have an immediate uh, effect. Uh, Looking into the future? I'm not very good at that. Um, <laughs> clearly, my hope would be that you know, the acute poverty could be eradicated, but um, one doesn't know going ahead. And so I'm not sure how sensibly I can add that, uh, address that. I think that the, what's clear is that as countries come to very low levels of multidimensional poverty, like Mexico, then they redefine their ambitions, and they use a similar structure, but now Mexico is 1.2% according to the global MPI of poverty, but 43% 40, according to their national MPI, because their aspirations and frames of reference have changed. And so in terms of poverty and development, hopefully there would be a re-articulation of the appropriate sets of goals, um, clearly if climate change uh, permitting and all of that, we are able to to reduce the kinds of acute poverty that we now face. And I think also that the psychological domains and that the other domains of well-being may come in uh, more strongly as we are able both to measure them and to think about sensible and pluralistic policy responses to them. There seems to be an appetite. So in a number of countries, not just Bhutan, uh, we are seeing at not only the poverty measure, but now them wanting to do a linked well-being measure um, that includes the dimensions of poverty um, but then goes beyond it to some of these soft things as an experimental measure, not yet to have the kind of seriousness of a poverty measure, but to try to keep these within the field of vision. And that, I think, will be, in a measurement terms, quite difficult, but interesting. Sabine, can I sort of just add one observation? And we've been spoken about data and so on, and, and, and I just hope you will bear with me just making one reference to, to wider work on Vietnam. We have actually put out a whole series of YouTube videos on what the data revolution actually means in practice. So, I mean, those who sort of want to try to get a sense of what some of these things actually mean in concrete practice out there and what you can do once you start over a period of 10, 15 years 
having built up a panel data set, um, what, sort of, what does it take to actually get to the point that some of these questions can be addressed in greater depth and so on? I, I mean, I'd like to sort of just make that point because um, I genuinely agree with you on this issue of that we do need to make sure that household surveys do not get sort of disappears in this uh, sort of big data is now all over there and, and it can answer all our questions. Big data cannot answer all our questions. We do need to get down to the household and individual level and collect that data in order to really come to grips with it. And so I'd sort of like to make that point. If I may, just as one final observation or question, um, I participated in the formulation of the SDGs and uh, I mean, I was in numerous meetings and of course, as the number of indicators and measures and so grew bigger and bigger, um, being, after all, trained as an economist, I started getting a bit worried because I was sort of thinking, okay, how do we operationalize all this? I mean, I, I, I certainly agreed with the political intentions behind it and so on, but I did get a bit worried about it. And then every time I would sort of ask about, um, do we actually need this measure or this indicator and so on, I was constantly confronted with the following statement. Rights are indivisible. Uh, you cannot uh, sort of start trading one uh, dimension off against another one. You have to have them both. And I'm kind of pondering what, what you think about that. I hope my, my question is clear because it's, it's something where I believe that uh, at least the economics profession, but also other professions have a big issue that we are not always kind of managing to, to get to click among us. So I was wondering whether you had some reflections on that. Well, I think two or three things. One is that not all SDGs might be framed as rights. So that's, that's why, yes, there is the language of integrated and indivisible there um, because they're, they're interlinked, but perhaps there's also a language of prioritization um, and then if you think of the incremental realization of social and cultural rights, there's also a recognition that with limited resources, it's essential, you know, it's impossible to, to advance on all of the fronts together. And so prioritization um, and setting medium term goals is essential because it is impossible to do otherwise. And I think that that actually where countries are engaging the SDGs, and not all, all are, that's the exciting point, is when they feel empowered then to look at that uh, basket of goods and select the first step of, of actions to be undertaken and that will actually put them towards the goal of realizing the SDGs, but do so in a way that also coheres with Agenda 2016 or agen with their national development plans or with some other um, priorities which are also salient because it's not only the SDGs that have a voice in so many contexts. Sure. <clears throat> Time has run out. I hope that, first of all, <clears throat> you will join me in saying thank you very much to Professor Akira. <clears throat> this was great. Um, as an afterthought, uh, there is a reception, uh, there is a glass of wine, and there's a bit of food also outside. Can I invite everybody to join us in the reception and let the conversation continue? And thank you very much. <laughs>